I pray even now you will feed us with fresh bread from heaven's bakery. We thank you for what you will do. Forgive us of our sins and grant us Bible repentance, Bible revival, Bible reformation. Bless us now, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to begin this great spiritual journey. Let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse number 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse number 9. The Bible says, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. The things that hath been done, those things shall be done. And the Bible says that there is no new thing, if you know it, say it with me, that there is no new thing under the sun. And what we're going to see throughout this study, as it was at the beginning of creation, so it's going to be in these closing scenes of earth's history. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1, go there with me, Genesis chapter 1. The Bible says in verse number 1 and in verse number 2, that just before God did create anything in this world, that darkness was upon the face of the deep. What was upon the face of the deep, my friends? It says darkness. As it was in the beginning, expect darkness in these last days. Genesis chapter 1. Look with me at verse number 1. In the beginning, God did create the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and what, friends? And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, everybody, let's read that, let there be light, and what? There was light, brothers and sisters, and I believe Satan loves to counterfeit everything that God does. And Satan, Popery, and the human allies are going to attempt to bring not only spiritual darkness, but literal darkness upon this earth. And the question is, am I prepared? The question is, are you prepared? And what are they going to affect negatively? They are going to affect the power grid, yes, friends, the electric grid. They are also going to launch a cyber attack to bring darkness upon this earth. Again, the question is, are we ready? Ready spiritually, are we in the right location? How many of you recall what happened in the Northeast in the year 2003? The great blackout. I remember that. Brothers and sisters, I drove that summer, August, summer from Huntsville, Alabama, to return home to see my parents. As I was there, this great blackout transpired. And beloved, I want to tell you something. It was a shock to people in the Northeast, even in Canada, all the way over to the Midwestern states. It was so <laughs> difficult. People didn't even have food, no power, no water. I remember after the blackout, I was driving back now to Huntsville, Alabama. I filled my vehicle with gasoline and on a full tank of gas. When I stopped to refuel, I walked inside the convenience store of that gas station. A big map was on the wall and you could see individuals looking at the map and they were seeing the blackout was all the way down where we are presently. In other words, God showed me on a full tank of gas in that crisis, you would not have been able to get out of the area, the geographical vicinity of that great blackout. Brothers and sisters, from that day until now, I said no more New York City for me. Praise the Lord, my friends. Notice what this says. I'm going to share with you a few clips regarding the great blackout of 2003. May I have some audio, preacher? Take a look at this. As they will tell us, my friends, simply an introduction, it was a history-making event. Take a look. Listen. We 
are in the midst of what appears to be a colossal and history-making blackout. People trapped in elevators and buildings. They have activated the emergency command center. You're staggering trying to take in as much information as you can. Mayor Bloomberg's advice is to go straight home. The subway system is down. Ottawa is completely without power now. The lightning-quick domino series of failures. You gotta go to the bathroom and you can't even go nowhere. 50 million people are thought to have lost power. In 2003, a massive blackout struck major areas of the U.S. and Canada and was perceived as a wake-up call for the nation. Mm, mm, mm. Now, friends, I'm not going to spend much time to elaborate why the clips speak for themselves. Notice the second clip here, addressing that a great blackout is ahead of us. Darkness is ahead of us. Listen. That's not right. But have 10 years of planning and preparation left us better off today? I don't think you can ever say with 100% confidence we won't have a blackout. My friends, and now notice, in the third clip they would, tell, they would tell us that there was no power, there was no water. How long can you survive without water to drink and water to take care of your needs, your bodily needs and needs in your home, household needs? Take a look at this, my friends. A massive power outage throughout much of the Northeast, both of the United States and of Canada. Millions and millions of people were caught by surprise when the electrical grid suddenly crashed. It shut down a hundred power plants, from Ottawa down to Cleveland and as far east as New York. They were caught by what? They were caught by surprise. Notice what this statement says, Christ Object Lessons. Page 412, it says, so now, a sudden and unlooked for calamity, something that brings the soul face to face with death, will show whether there is any real faith in the promises of God. Look at this, prophets and kings. Page 626 says, Christians should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming, what friends? An overwhelming surprise how many were caught by surprise. And this preparation they should make by diligently studying the word of God and striving to conform their lives to its precepts. God calls for what two things in these last days? Revival and reformation. Watch this now. Listen, how many people were actually thirsty in drought as a result? How many were caught by surprise? Take a look. Getting out. A normal August afternoon had turned to crisis. Around 50 million people across the U.S. and Canada were left without power. All of Cleveland's water supply runs on electric pumps. My water commissioner said, the people in the Heights have water for three hours. I said, water? I thought the electric was out. He said, Mayor? How do you think the water gets from the lake to the people in the heights? You can get along in the dark, you can get along in the heat, but uh, water becomes a health and safety issue very quickly. No, first, think about this. Think about this for a minute right here. What if we're in the country and the only water source we have is a well, and your well runs off electricity, but you don't have a backup system? I was once there, I know, what it, I know how it feels. When the power goes out and there's no water coming from your taps in your home, why? Because your well is connected to the power grid of that city, that county. We have to be, begin to think about what? Alternative power sources. My friends, the crisis is upon us. Notice, how many hours were there Darkness around Calvary's cross. How many hours, my friends? The Bible tells us from the sixth until when? The ninth hour, three hours. But how long was the great blackout in 2003? For 29 long hours. Imagine that, brothers and sisters. And that was August 14th. What is August time period? Is it, is it spring? No, autumn. It is Summer. Take a look at this, brothers, and imagine if it was winter. Listen, it says, watch carefully, my friends. God's Sabbath 
shall be a special object of contempt, Satan says. Watch this now. Human laws will be made so stringent that men and women will not dare to observe what? The seventh day Sabbath. For fear of wanting what two things? Food. Food and clothing. They will join with the world in what? Transgressing God's laws. All right, my friends. And where are God's people to be as we're seeing these signs? Adventist home, page 141. Where, my friends? In the countries, in the rural districts. What if there was a great blackout? And now, they say, in order for you to access things for your survival, you have to go along with all of these stipulations. What would you do? How many would then bow, brothers and sisters? I was saying to my wife, many of God's professed people are living in a time of fantasy. They're daydreaming, castle building. We should be living in reality. Listen to what this says. Give me some order, preachers back there. Listen. It took 29 hours for the power to be turned back on in most major cities. But the brief outage contributed to at least 11 deaths and caused an estimated $6 billion in economic losses. <laughs> and friends, now they're talking about cyber terror. Cyber terror. Look at this, brothers and sisters. Listen. We know from lots of anecdotal examples that the terrorists that use cyber terror uh, are very inventive. They know that if they could bring down an electric power grid system, uh, that would cause really maximum damage. This is a big, big challenge for our country. Now, I want to ask you a question. Can the same powers that be leaders create the crisis to get their agenda across? Let me give you a Bible for your feet. Do you remember Emperor Nero? What did Nero do? He created great red words, great calamities, great famine, great pestilence, great earthquake in the land and blame somebody else to get his agenda across. And what was one of his aims? To destroy what group of people? To destroy what group of people? God's faithful Christians. All right, brothers and sisters. Take a look at this. Listen. Uh, do you remember Leon Panetta? Huh? He's telling us, expect a cyber Pearl Harbor. You remember Pearl Harbor? What event did Pearl Harbor create? What was it a catalyst for? World War II. How much controversy surrounds Pearl Harbor? Listen. The collective result of these kinds of attacks could be a cyber Pearl Harbor. And the question is, what if after August 2003, the Sunday law, no buy, no sell, with persecution was then enacted? Where were we physically in 2003? Where were we spiritually in 2003? Where were we financially in 2003? Where were we? Adam, where art thou? Not literally, but spiritually, are we prepared? And now they're doing uh, simulations, mock drills, because they know something is about to take place and God's people are going to be taken by great surprise. How many of you like surprises? Not me. Listen. This week, more than 200 private and public energy companies will stage a large-scale mock blackout. No lights will go out, but the drill will test how government and utility workers would react if the grid went down. If you bring down the electric power grid system in this country and it stays down for any length of time at all, it'll wreck the American economy. That's it. So we've got a lot at stake, and we better, we better keep our eye on the ball. What would, what would it do to the economy in America and around the world? And think about this. Whose currency is the world's reserves currency? The United States dollar. You destroy this currency, you have a domino effect across the whole world. Destroying the world's economy. And what great reason would they call for a Sunday law? Hmm? To restore temporal what? To restore 
temporal prosperity, great controversy, page 590. And the Pope also said, and for Sunday to care for the poor, Sunday to take care of nature. Now that was 2013, the retro report. Let's come current. Do you remember the World Economic Forum director, Mr. Kloss? He says this, take a listen. We all know. The Great Reset, listen. We all know, but still pay insufficient attention to the frightening scenario of a comprehensive cyber attack, which would bring to a complete halt to the power supply, transportation, hospital services, our society as a whole. The COVID-19 crisis would be seen in this respect as a small disturbance in comparison to a major cyber attack. To Get your writing instrument. Go to March Chapter 1 with me. In March Chapter 1, I'm going to share with you now, we have just covered, covered the current events. I'm going to share with you now that this study together will follow and fall into four primary categories. Number one, prophecy. Put that down, prophecy. Number two, urgency. Urgency. Number three, repentance and preparation. Repentance and preparation. And number four, brothers and sisters, we need to believe in Christ. Have the faith in Christ and the faith of Jesus Christ. Those four categories. My friend, let's continue with the prophecy. Go to Exodus chapter 10. Where are we going to, my friends? By the way, that text in Mark chapter 1, to confirm, it's Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and verse 15. When Christ began preaching, the Bible says Christ said, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Does that sound like prophecy? The time is full. That's prophecy. The kingdom of God is at hand. That's urgency. Repent. That's preparation. And believe the gospel. We are going to need the faith in Christ and the faith of Jesus Christ. Let's go. Exodus, what chapter are we going to, my friends? Exodus chapter 10. And look with me at verse number 21. The Bible tells us, as it was in the time in Egypt, just before the Exodus, towards Canaan, the earthly promised land, so it's going to be. In the last days, did God bring darkness on the land of Egypt? Did he, my friends? The Bible says he brought darkness for three literal days. And the darkness was very thick. You could feel it. And what we're going to see, that darkness came from God. It was supernatural. But Satan, the papacy, and their allies will bring about not only spiritual darkness, but literal darkness by attacking the power grid, by attacking cyber technologies. This is how they are going to work. And the Bible tells us in the book of Exodus chapter 10 that the darkness was connected to service, serving God. The darkness was connected to worship. So now you can see why Satan... The papacy and also their allies are going to bring not only spiritual darkness, but literal darkness now to then enforce Sunday worship by law. Exodus 10. Look with me at verse 21. Are we there, my friends? And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be what? Darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt. How, how long? For three days. Verse 23, but who had light in that time of darkness? Who had light? Verse 23, but all the children of Israel had what? Light in their dwellings. What is God saying to us? about the practical work of preparation. We need to start thinking about alternative power. Is that point clear, my friends? Not only power, literally, but spiritual 
Power, brothers and sisters. Come with me. Look with me now at verse number 24. That darkness was connected to worship. Verse 24, and Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. What, my friends? Serve the Lord. But by the way, take your little ones, but don't take any cattle. But what did Moses say now in verse number 26? Or a cattle also shall go with us. There shall not an hoof be left behind. For thereof must we take to what? Serve the Lord our God. And we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come thither. What is synonymous to the word serve in the Bible? Talk to me now. Worship. What text say that? Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 10. Jesus said, Thou must worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou what? Finish that. Him only shalt thou serve. Do you see now how the darkness was connected to worship? Does it make sense? So what was Satan, the papacy, and the allies do with the darkness to bring about what event? False worship by law. Skip on down to verse number 28. The Bible also said that darkness was linked to persecution. Look at verse 28. Pharaoh said to Moses, get thee from me. Take heed to thyself. See my face no more. For in that day thou seest my face. Thou shalt what? You mean he was about to drop dead? What was Pharaoh doing? He was threatening Moses to kill Moses. And verse 29, And Moses said to Pharaoh, Thou hast spoken well. I will see thy face again. How? What did Moses know? No more. That he would die, brothers and sisters. The darkness, get it right, was connected to false worship. That's what we're going to see. Just as darkness was linked to true worship from the hand of Jesus Christ. Look with me. Revelation chapter 16. Where are we going to, my friends? Revelation chapter 16. Now, when they bring the spiritual darkness, when they bring that literal darkness upon the earth, and then Sunday worship by law is enforced, what will God send down from heaven upon the unrepentant people? The plagues. And is there a plague of darkness, my friends? What number plague is that of the seven? It is plague number five. Revelation. Where are we going to, friends? What chapter? Revelation chapter 16. And look with me at verse number 10, the Bible says. Watch carefully. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. Who is the beast power? Talk to me. Who is the beast power? It's the papacy. Hold on. And his kingdom was full of darkness. Darkness, my friends. And they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. Why no repentance? Because probation has already been closed. The Holy Spirit of God has been withdrawn from the unrepentant sinners. There's no more opportunity for them to be saved. Does that make sense, my friends? Now watch carefully. Why does God send upon the beast, his kingdom, the papacy, and her allies, the plague of darkness? Why? This is the key. Why? Because there's a principle in the Bible that says, what you do unto others will be done unto you. Why the plague of darkness upon the papacy? Because the papacy will bring literal darkness upon this earth. Does it make sense? Let's get the principle. Revelation 13. Go there. That's the principle. Don't miss it. Revelation chapter 13. The Bible says, okay, my son, the Bible says in verse number 10, the Bible says, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. If you kill with the sword, you must be what? Killed with the sword. All right, go with me now. I'm going to share with you one of the reasons why God will also send a plague 
of pestilence upon the papacy is because she is behind pestilence 19 and many of the pestilences that have hit this earth. You want it, my friends? Look with me. Revelation chapter 18. All right. Where are we going to, my friends? Revelation chapter 18. Look with me at verse number 8. If you're there, just say, may I hear your voices? Amen. All right, thank you. Look with me. At verse number 8, the Bible says, Therefore, speaking of Babylon, verse 2 and verse 3, verse number 8 says, Therefore shall her what? Her plagues come in one day. Could you pause there for a minute? What is a plague? Is a plague a pestilence? So why would God bring the plague of pestilence upon the papacy? Why now? Based on the principle of Revelation 13.10. You know what? Could you hold your place right here in Revelation 18? Go to Matthew chapter 7. All right, you're going to see it now. Where are we going to, my friends? Matthew chapter 7. And the Bible says in verse number 1, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. There it is now. With what measure you meet, it shall be what measured unto you again. So why will God send pestilences upon Babylon? Why? Because Babylon has brought what upon mankind? Pestilences. So is it a stretch? Are we speculating to say all woes lead to, all woes lead to the papacy? And that it is real to believe the papers is also behind pestilence 19 and its various variants. Go back with me to Revelation 18. Go back to verse 8. Therefore, her plague shall come in one day. What's next? Death. What's next? Mourning. What's next? Famine. Why will God bring famine upon Babylon? Based on the principle of Revelation 13, 10 and Matthew 7, verse 1 and verse 2. Why? Because she has instigated famine upon mankind. Does it make sense? Why would God send death and mourning upon the papacy? Talk to me, my friends. Why? Based on the principle, she is behind the great persecutions, the great uh, massacres, the great genocides, the great mourning upon mankind. If that makes sense, my friend, say amen. Does it make sense? And the Bible tells us Christ never allows us to go through anything he himself did not go through. And the Bible confirms that point by showing us Jesus himself encountered the powers of darkness at the first advent. And the powers of darkness that Christ encountered, it was connected to persecution. Look with me. Luke chapter 22. Where are we going to? All right. Look with me. Luke 22. And the Bible tells us in verse number 52. Look at this, my friends. It says, if you're there, the Bible says now, Then saith Christ unto the chief priests, and captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, be you come out as against a thief with swords and staves. When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me. Let's read now. What did Christ say now? But this is your hour. This is your hour and the power of Darkness. So what did Christ encounter at the first advent? The power of darkness. Did that also, was that also connected to crucifixion, to persecution? So what will God's faithful people encounter in the last days? The power of darkness, both spiritually, mm -hmm, literally the lights going out, a blackout, and also persecution. Does it make sense? And what scripture confirms this? Watch this. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 12 says what? For we wrestle. Finish that. For we what? Uh, okay, go there with me. Some of you are guessing. Go there with me. Let's do this together. Where are we going to, my friends? Ephesians chapter 6. Look with me at verse number 12. For we wrestle not against flesh, 
and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers. Who are the rulers? Who are the rulers? The rulers of the darkness. The rulers of the darkness of this world. Spiritual wickedness where? In high places. So what now does verse 13 say? What are we to put on, my friends? Verse 13 says what now? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, stand, oh brothers and sisters, dare to be a what? Daniel, dare to stand how? Alone, dare to have a purpose firm and dare to make what? And dare to make it known. My friends, we need some urgency. That's your second category. What is it, my friends? Urgency. Go to Revelation 13 with me. Let's take a look at urgency. The Bible tells us that fire, put down fire. The Bible tells us that miracles put down miracles. The Bible tells us deception put down deception. That fire, miracles, deceptions are all going to proceed, all going to precede the national Sunday law. I'm going to put some fire under you today. Urgency. Where are we going to, my friends? Revelation chapter 13. Look with me at verse number 13. You remember what Jeremiah said? That word was like what? Fire shot up in my bones. I tried to keep quiet, but I could not stay. Luke 24 now. Did not our hearts cool within us? Mm -mm. Burn within us. And how does Christ say we must be? Based on Revelation chapter 3. I would that thou wert hot, brothers and sisters. Let's go. Revelation chapter 13. Look at verse 13. The Bible says, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh, what's the number one? Fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And what now? Number two, deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those, number three, by the means of those miracles. And verse number 14 says, The image of the beast is now formed. Verse number 15 now says, the mark of the beast is now in force. If you don't worship falsely, you're going to be killed. Now take your writing instrument. Watch carefully now, friends. Put down the word miracles. In the Bible, miracles many times is used synonymously with plagues. With what? Plagues. Do you know what Ten things did God send upon the ancient unrepentant Egyptians? Plagues. And the Bible calls it miracles. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 11. I know, but remember, like in the English language, one word can have different meanings, different applications. Miracles also point to God's chastisement, God's judgment, God's destruction upon unrepentant sinners. Deuteronomy, what chapter? Deuteronomy chapter 11. Look with me, my friends, at verse number 2 through verse number 4. If you're there, just say amen. Urgency, it says, I know you this day, for I speak not with your children, which have not known and which have not seen the chastisement. What does that mean? The chastisement of God, his greatness, his mighty hand, his stretched out arm. Verse 3, and his what now? His miracles and his acts which he did in the midst of Egypt unto Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and unto all his land. Verse 4, and what he did unto the army of Egypt, their horses, their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea to drown all of them. Miracles linked to what? God's chastisement, God's plagues. That's Bible. Now comes Spirit of Prophecy. Great controversy. Past that. Page 574. Look at the bottom paragraph. Miracles, what's that word, friends? Miracles also were called into requisition. Look at this. Miracles, <laughs> judgment, among other wonders, it was reported that what? A husbandman 
who was about to plow his field on Sunday clean his plow with an iron, but the iron stuck fast in his hand. Miracles, calamities, great controversy now. Page 579, watch this, red words. As with the papal leaders who want fabricated what, friends? Miracles to supply the place of a command from God. The assertion now that God's judgments are falling upon men for their violation of the Sunday Sabbath will be repeated. That's it. Already, it is beginning to be urged and a movement to enforce Sunday observance is fast. Is fa that's urgency. Is fast gaining ground. The miracles, the calamities, and what great convention, convocation, symposium is happening now in the UK. COP26. Do you see what's happening, friends? And why? They are saying calamities are here. It's time for the papal solution from Laudata Sea. Look at this, my friends. Who is on your screen right here from the UK? Prime Minister Boris Johnson. I won't play his audio. Forget about his, his voice. What is on the line red? What did he say, my friends, at COP26? What are they saying as leaders? It is what? One minute to midnight. Does that spell urgency? Yet God's people are at ease in Zion. Past that. Look at this, my friends. Time Magazine. Oh, where's my date? Time Mag This just came out. Time Magazine. What is on the line red? Those four words. Last call for climate. Now, friends, take a look at the picture. The illustration. This is a montage. Look what's happening there. What stands out to you? As calamities. Anybody? What stands out to you? Lightnings. What else? By the way, if you go back to that statement, in Great Controversy, page 575, did I put it there? Lightnings? Just go back and read that, that paragraph. Those paragraphs on that page. Page 574 and 575. Move on. Come back here, my friends. You see lightnings. What else? What else? Huh? You see snow, snowstorms? What else do you see? Hail, hailstorms. What else do you see? Do you see drought, famine? What else do you see? Do you see tornadoes? Do you see fires? And people are, maybe those are zombies in the background. I don't know, but two words. Last call, Time Magazine. Do you think Time Magazine is playing games? Do they know what they're doing? This is the propaganda machine for Satan, the papacy, and their allies. They know what they're doing. Here's my point. If they don't get the Sunday law very, very soon, they will create what you see on the Time Magazine article here. They will fabricate these miracles, create these crises, and then say, God's judgments are falling upon us. And the only way to survive, we must turn back to God and worship God so God can bless America. Well, worship God on what day? Sunday by law. Look at this, brothers and sisters. You remember Time Magazine again? Look at this, Time Magazine. And what did they publish October 21st or 22nd or 20th? 21st, 2020, top right corner. This is Mariana Mazzucato. I covered this before from Time Magazine. And notice this article was showing how she was 100% accurate in her prediction. Well, do you know what she predicted? She predicted that great calamities, apocalyptic in nature is coming the summer of 2022. How many more months do we have left? That's your timetable. And that's why I'm making sense of this in your ears. That's why now you have Boris Johnson now saying it's one minute to midnight. If you don't get our agenda passed in COP26, you, we will force your hand that's why they are saying, my friends, watch carefully. It's the last call. 
Do you know why? Watch this now. Mariana Mazzucato, I covered this October 1st, 2021. You can take a look at the video. Won't spend time on that to go through the minute details. But notice here, she says, pass this when she predicted Joe Biden's win. Pass that. Accuracy. Listen now, she says, in the summer of 2022, the other major crisis of our age took a turn for the apocalyptic climate breakdown finally landed in the developed world, testing the resilience of social systems in the Midwestern U.S. states. A severe what now? Drought wiped out crops. Famine? Huh. And that supplied one-sixth of the world's grain output. Brothers and sisters, watch now. People woke up to the need for governments to form a coordinated response to climate change and direct global fiscal stimulus in support of a green economy. Now she's saying, because of the apocalyptic crises, the people now would say, governments, governments, enact what the Pope says is the primary solution to combat climate change. And remember, the call for a Sunday law does not come from the top per se, but from the bottom. The grassroots, great controversy confirms, page 592, the people will demand of their leaders for the enforcing a Sunday observance, brothers and sisters. And now, what is she calling for? A climate lockdown. You want to stop the climate crisis? Then shut the world down, just as the world was shut down during what crisis? Pestilence 19. Shut down. But by the way, you think they can shut this thing down for seven days? Mm -mm. One day a week, my friends. Sunday, Sabbath. Watch the nail in a sure place. One more article to confirm that. Notice now, who is she connected to? That's the nail in the coffin. That's the nail in the sure place. Mariana Mazzucato, linked to whom? Pope Francis, brothers and sisters. That's the nail in a sure place. And a second witness, she even tweeted about the Pope on her Twitter platform. Urgency, brothers and sisters. Go with me to Psalm 91. Where are we going to, my friends? Please watch that video, October 1st, 2000. And 21, Psalm 91. So what are we to expect in these last days? Expect a great blackout, great darkness is ahead. But should we be trepid? Should we be scared? Should we be dismayed? My friends, make sure we have spiritual light in our soul. Spiritual light in our homes. Make sure we have alternative light Power on our properties. Stop living in a gaze, brothers and sisters. God in his mercy is holding back the four winds of strife. And yet many are so arrogant. I don't see any Sunday law on the horizon. I don't see any Sunday law in the pipeline. No, there's a Sunday law in the sewage line. Urgency. It's coming. Psalm 91. This scripture is very potent. I'll tell you why. My friends, we have heard of pestilence 19. Have you ever heard of pestilence of darkness? Look at verse number 5. Are we there, my friends? Verse 5 says, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh how? We're in darkness. So what are we to expect yet not fear? A pestilence of darkness, a plague of darkness. But this is talking about God's plague of darkness, God's pestilence of darkness. And God's people are going to be preserved. Why? Because they're dwelling where? Talk to me, verse 1. Because they are dwelling where? In the secret place. Hold on now. Secret place. 
secret place. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 33, those who dwell in the secret place, in the munitions of rocks, that's in the country, their bread shall be given them and their waters shall be sure. But Satan is going to bring a counterfeit, brothers and sisters. Now put the phrase down, from pestilence 19 to pestilence darkness. Do you see it now, my friends? And before God brings this pestilence of darkness, the fifth plague, Satan will bring his counterfeit. Does it make sense, my friends? Satan will bring his counterfeit. Remember, great controversy, page 4, 6, Four says, the counterfeit always precedes the genuine Ezekiel 8. Go there with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Ezekiel chapter 8. If we believe a son the law is near, then what must we expect is nearer? Satan's plague of darkness. Spiritually, literally. Are we ready, my friends? And now I'm going to prove the plague of darkness, Satan's darkness, is linked to a son the law. It's linked to nature worship. Ready for this? Ezekiel chapter 8. Look with me at verse number 12. If you're there, just say amen, my friends. It says, Then said God unto Ezekiel, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do wear? Do wear? Where were they operating? In the dark. Do you know what they were doing in darkness? Look at verse number 14. What were they weeping for? Who were, who were they weeping for? They were weeping for Tammuz. Hold on now. That means the power, the rulers of darkness, the power, the rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. The Bible tells us the rulers of darkness weep for whom? What is Tammuz linked to? There it is. Won't spend time on this. Tammuz was the god of na the heathen, god of nature. That's it, my friends. Tammuz, the god of the green, and so on. By the way, that's the encyclopedia. It's Britannica. Right. Tammuz, the power of darkness, is linked to nature worship. What's going on at COP26? Nature worship. All right, there it is again, my friends. Tammuz was also the god of uh, the sun. The sun god, second paragraph. Tammuz, do you want one more? There, by the way, Tammuz, orgies, lasciviousness and licentiousness. It's all there. Tammuz, skip on down to verse 16. What was also linked to the rulers of darkness? Verse 16, what do you have there, my friends? What did they turn their backs toward? God's temple. And what did they turn their face toward? Their face toward the east. And what did they worship? The S-U-N. The S-U-N God, brothers and sisters. So what is the powers of darkness linked to nature worship and what? Sun worship. Do you see it, my friends? Now let's fill in the blanks. So from Pestilence 19... To pestilence, darkness, then comes a Sunday law. But what will God say next? The plagues, even the fifth plague, the plague of darkness, brothers and sisters. Do we see God's chastisement in Ezekiel 8 now? Verse 17, verse 18, yes. And what happened now in Ezekiel chapter 9? Ezekiel 9. And verse number one through verse number six, where God's people sealed. Yes. So as we see the powers of darkness working to bring about spiritual and literal darkness, what work is almost over? The sealing of God's people. Am I being sealed? Are you being sealed? And 2 Timothy Chapter 2 and verse 19 tells us the sealing of God's people is getting victory over sin. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from what, friends? From iniquity. The sealing of God's people is almost over.
Volume 5, page 211 says, the class that do not feel grieved over their own spiritual declension, no mourn for the sins of others, will be left without the seal of God. It's time, my friends. Urgency. Look with me. Romans chapter 13. Where are we going to, friends? Now, we have come to our third segment and for those of you who wrote down the four parts of our study, what is segment part number three, the heading? Oh, my friend, what is it now? Repentance, preparation, Mark chapter 1, verse 14, verse 15. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, preparation. Where are we going to, friends? Romans, what chapter? Romans chapter 13. What does the Bible say in verse number 11? High time? Let's read that. Verse number 11 says, And that knowing the time, and that knowing the time, that now it is what, my friends? High time to awake out of sleep. Why? For now, for now is your salvation nearer than when you believe. Verse 12, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us do what now? Cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on what, everybody? The armor of light. So what darkness is this? What darkness is this? A power outage? What darkness is this? A blackout? What darkness is this? It's spiritual darkness, spiritual declension, spiritual uh, degradation, backsliding. You're retrograding back into sin. This is the darkness. It's time to cast that off. Why? Knowing the time. That's it. The time is fulfilled. You get the point now. The kingdom of God is at hand. Now do what? Repent. Cast off the works of darkness. If that makes sense, say amen, my friends. Now notice, what are we to put on? What must we put on? The armor of light. I'll come back to that. One thing I've seen. God uses the natural to make known the spiritual. If you want to know how to get victory over some darling sins, don't forget this. Bring in more of the good. And the good you bring in will spoil your appetite for that which is bad. How do you respire? How do you breathe? How do you breathe? How did God make man? In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, God formed man out of the dust of the ground and what breathed into. So the first thing you do is inhale that which is good. Oxygen. Then you can what? Exhale that which is bad. Bring in more good, my friends. You want victory over worldly music? What are you to do then? Hmm. Listen more of the hymns, the true spiritual songs. We must put off the works of darkness and put on what? The armor of what? Of light. And the Bible calls that armor of light. The righteousness of Jesus Christ. The Bible calls it the wedding garment. My friends, I want to be married to Christ. How about you? What does that mean, by the way? To be married means to be one. The two shall become what? One flesh, one flesh, one flesh. When I pray to Christ, I want Christ to answer my prayer. Well, my friends, Jesus has a prayer request. In John chapter 17, Christ prayed, Father, I would, I will, that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they might behold my glory, that they might be one with me as I am one with you. Christ has a prayer request, and that prayer request we alone individually can answer. And today I choose to answer that prayer request of Christ. I choose to be one with him. How about you? But to be one with Christ, we have to, what? Cast off the works of darkness. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 1 says, God's hand is not shortened. 
God's ears, not heavy, but our iniquity has separated between ourselves and our God that God cannot hear nor deliver. We must cast off the works of darkness. Now watch, the Bible says we must choose today. Do you choose to cast off the works of darkness? Do you choose to put on the armor of light? If so, don't just say amen. Raise your right hand, my friends. Amen. Hands down. Now notice, this goes for those of you online, Save to Serve International, and first-time viewers. The Bible says now, those who refuse to cast off the works of darkness. Let me switch that. Those who refuse to put on. Let's keep it that way. To cast off the works of darkness by confession of sin. So Christ can clothe them with his wedding garment. The Bible says they will be cast out into outer, finish that, outer darkness. What darkness is that? The second death. Does it make sense? How many applications does the word darkness have? Go to Matthew 22 with me, my friends. Where are we going to? Matthew 22. The Bible says this thing is new. The Bible says it's sweet. Oh, my friends. Matthew, what chapter? Matthew 22. Look with me at verse number 12. Bible says, and Christ saith unto him, friend, how does Christ want to style and call us, my friends? Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having on a wedding garment? And he was what? Speechless. Then said the king to the servants, bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into what now? Outer darkness. There shall be what now? Weeping. And what? Gnashing of teeth. Another application for darkness, brothers and sisters. So many different perspectives for the word darkness. How practically can we surrender, get victory over sin? So Christ can clothe us with his garment of righteousness once we surrender. Look at the screen here, my friends. Christ's object lessons, <laughs> weeping for the wrong thing. Christ's object lessons, page 311 says, by Christ's perfect obedience, he has made it possible for how many? Every human being to obey God's commandments. Do you believe it? It says, when we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart. The will is merged into his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. Praise God. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. But what's the first step? When we submit. What's the first step? When we submit. When we submit. What does James chapter 4 and verse 7 say? Submit. Submit. Oh, you all know it. Come, say it with me. Submit yourselves therefore unto God. And what will happen? You have power now to resist the devil, and what? He will flee from you. Verse 8, draw, come on, draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. The first step, submit. And once we submit, he gives us power to what? Resist. It goes back to my analogy with breathing. Do you see it, my friends? Inhale in the good, you can exhale the bad. Submit first, then he gives you power to resist. You say yes to Christ. He gives you power to say no to the flesh and no to Satan. If that makes sense, you know what to say. Get back to the screen, my friends. Red words. This is what it means. To be clothed with the garment of Christ's what? Righteousness. What is righteousness? It's right doing. Doing that which is right. That's 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness 
is righteous as He, God, is righteous. Righteousness is something that we do. Our will must be merged into Christ's will. I'm not sure how much more of this you need. Go to Romans chapter 1. It's time for self-examination. My friends, I had to wrestle with God in prayer. Lord, is there darkness in my soul? You today have to wrestle with God in prayer. Is there darkness in my home? Is there darkness in my marriage? Is there darkness in my relationships with siblings? Is there darkness in my heart? Is there darkness, dear God? It's time for self-examination. Do you want to examine yourself or do you think you're okay? And that's the problem with lukewarm Laodiceans. They refuse to see their need. I'm okay, they say. But what does God say in response? I'm going to spew poo. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. You are grotesque to my presence. If you remain unrepentant, it's time for self-examination. No joke here, my friends. It's time. Is there darkness in my soul from... What time preachers? From what, 9 a.m. this morning, working with these boxes back there to go live? From 9 a.m. all the way to what time? 3 o'clock. That's six hours of darkness. Come on, Lord. Give us some light, please, we beg of you. Romans chapter 1. Look with me at verse number 21. Now, Look for what I'm going to share with you. The Bible says, uh, the Bible describes those who have a dark heart, darkness in their souls, as people who worship on Sunday. Oh, my Lord. Watch now. The Bible says those who meddle in the LGBT lifestyle, they have a darkened soul. Those who love fornication, those who love adultery, those who love to gossip and backbite. They have a darkened soul. Those who are unforgiving, those who have envy, envious, those who ill-treat each other, those people have a darkened soul. Children who don't obey their parents in the Lord, they have a darkened soul. Time for self-examination. Let's go. Romans chapter 1. Look at verse 21. It says, because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Let's read now, last phrase. And their what? And their foolish heart was darkened. What was darkened? Their foolish heart Go to verse number 24, heart, verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the loss of their own, what's the next word? Hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Verse 25, these are nature worshipers, idolaters who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature. The creature worship more than the creator. So who are the people who have darkness in their souls? They are creature worshipers, nature worshipers. Question, what is the chief God of nature for nature worshipers? S-U-N. Emperor Constantine of Rome in 321 A.D. He was a nature worshiper, a pagan, idolater, and he said, the S-U-N gave me victory. So now, everybody must worship on what day? S-U-N, D-A-Y, Sunday, darkness in their souls. Mm -hmm. It's time for self-examination. And for those of you online and first-time viewers, you can huff, you can puff, you can reject, you cannot blow down the truth. You can do nothing against the truth, only for the truth. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 8. And Galatians chapter 4 and verse 16 says, Am I become your enemy because I have told you the truth? That nature worshippers, sun worshippers, Sunday worshippers who reject God's worship of the creator, who rejects Sabbath worship, the seventh day of the week. Those people have 
They have darkness in their souls. Jesus says we worship him because he's what? Creator. Revelation 14 verse 7, fear God and give what? Glory to him. Why? The hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made. Is he creator? Heaven, earth, the seas, and the fountains of waters. What day must we worship him, him on? Because he is our creator. What day, my friends? The seventh day of the week, commonly called Saturday. Exodus 20 and verse number 11. 8 to 11. Skip on down. Romans chapter 1. The Bible now says those who practice sodomy, the LGBT lifestyle, they have darkness in their souls. Look at verse 26. And verse 27, the LGBT lifestyle, women with women, men with men, darkness in their souls. Brothers, is God talking to us, my friends? Am I become your enemy because I have told you the truth? Skip on down to verse number 28. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So God gave them over. To a reprobate what? Mind. Look at verse 29. What is also a sign of darkness of heart? Unrighteousness. Is that you? Fornication. Pastors, elders, fornication. Wickedness. Is that you? Covetousness. Is that you? Maliciousness. Full of envy. Murder. Is that you? Debate. Deceit. Biters. Is that you, proud, boasters? Is that you, disobedient to parents? Verse 30, is that you? Verse 21, without understanding, covenant breakers. What two great covenants did God establish in the Garden of Eden? What two great covenants? The marriage covenant, and what else, my friends? The Sabbath covenant, covenant breakers. No fault, divorce, darkness in their souls. Come back to verse number 31, my friends. Have I become your enemy because I have told you the truth? Verse 32, now the Bible says, And knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only those who do the same, but those who have pleasure in them that do them. Darkness, it's time for self-examination. And that's why I say, Lord, shine your light into my soul. What happens when there's a dark room? How do you dispel darkness? How? By bringing in what? Light, brothers and sisters. In a spiritual sense, in a practical sense, how do we get victory over these sins? My friends, write this down. We are told in messages to young people, page 131, I saw how this grace could be obtained. I saw how victory over sin could be obtained. Go to your closet and there alone plead with God. What must we pray? Pray the words of God, even Psalm 51, which says what in verse 10? Create in me a clean heart, O God, a clean what? Heart. Romans 1 said in verse 21, their foolish heart was darkened. How can we get victory? Go into your closet and they're alone, alone, alone. While family worship is important. Family worship should not take the place of personal, individual communing with Jesus Christ. Go into your closet, young people, adults, and fear alone. Plead with God. Say what now? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Be earnest, be sincere, Jacob-like, wrestle with God. Listen, don't leave your closet until you feel strong in God. Then watch and pray. And just as long as you watch and pray, you can keep evil 
besetments under. And the grace of God can, the grace of God will appear in you. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, the Bible says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity, how many thoughts? Every thought to the obedience of Christ, gospel workers. Page 100 says, guard jealously. Guard how? Guard jealously. Your hour of prayer, Bible study, and self-examination. Set aside a portion of each day for the searching of scriptures and communing with God. Thus you will obtain spiritual strength. And grow in favor with God. You must guard jealously your hour of daily communion. Ministry of healing. Page 51 we are told. My friends, Jesus. Jesus on earth. He communed with nature and with God. In this communion, Christ has revealed to us the secret. The what? The secret of a life of power. Power, not only literal power, electricity, but spiritual power, evening. Come on, Psalm 55 verse 17 says what? Evening, morning, and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he will hear my voice. And what now? He will deliver us. Will God deliver us? Desire of ages. Page 363 says, Christ as a man supplicated the throne of God until his humanity was charged with a heavenly current. Do you want power, my friends? We must spend time in daily individual communion and then we can go forward with the work of aggressive Effective evangelism with lettering power. The loud cry message. Go to Isaiah chapter 60. Where are we going to, my friends? Fresh bread from heaven's bakery. Are you hungry? It's a question from yours truly. Look at this, my friends. Isaiah, what chapter? Isaiah chapter 60. Look with me at verse number one. Arise. Are we there, my friends? Arise. Are we there, my friends? Arise. Shine. Why? For thy light is come, and the glory, latter in power, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Verse 2. For behold, what will cover the earth, my friends? What will cover the earth, my friends? Verse 2. Behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness and gross darkness the people, but, let's read now, the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Verse 3, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light. So what will the Gentiles be running from since they are coming to our light? What will they be running from, my friends? They are running from darkness. What a connection. In the book of Exodus, chapter 10, when God sent the plague of darkness, did everybody experience darkness? Mm -mm. There was light in the dwelling of the children of Israel. That was literal and spiritual. Isaiah chapter 60 now, verse 2. For darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to what? Thy light, thy light. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16 says, Let thy light, finish that, let thy light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Revelation. Chapter 18 and verse 1 says, After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth, finish that, and the earth was lightened with his glory, and he cried with a loud voice, 
Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. Do you know why? Because Babylon has brought spiritual and literal darkness on the earth. But what now says verse 4? Come out of her, my people. So what will they be running from? The darkness of Babylon. To what? God's marvelous light. Let's go. Matthew chapter 6. Beloved, that's why we have come to this vicinity. That's why we have come to this vicinity. Why? Because this city is in gross darkness. The very sins of Romans chapter 1 are prevalent in this city. Darkness cannot dispel darkness. So what do we all need? The light of Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. Does that make sense? Now, what is number four? The fourth part, the last part. Ah, oh, my friends, the time is fulfilled. Come on. Number four is what now? Believe. Believe in whom? Believe in Christ. Have faith in Christ. The faith of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 6. Where are we going to, my friends? In Matthew chapter 6, the Bible tells us that those who are doubtful, those who are unbelief, the Bible says those who worry about food, worry about drink, worry about raiment, worry about unemployment, those who are stressed out. The Bible says doubt and unbelief will bring darkness into your soul. And by God's grace, I want to dispel the darkness of doubt, unbelief, depression from your soul. Will you allow Christ? Look at Matthew 6. Are we there, my friends? I told you it's fresh bread from heaven's bakery. Matthew, what chapter, my friends? Look at verse number. I like this. Look at verse 23. It says, for if thine eye... Be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man therefore can serve what? Two masters. Verse 25, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, for what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor how you shall Clothe your body. What you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. If you're focusing more on these things, the Bible says there's darkness in your soul. Verse 30, the Bible says, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? What are the next five words? It's a question. O ye of little faith. Stop worrying. Verse number 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. Why? The morrow shall take care of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Many borrow tomorrow's trouble for today. That's why we are told, my friends, in volume 7, page 298, worry, worry. One more time, worry. You knew where I was going. Let's go together. Worry is what? My friends, remember, it's not just saying it. Come on, worry is blind and cannot discern the future. But God knows the end from the what? The beginning. In every difficulty, God has a way prepared to bring relief. And remember, don't just say the quotation. You must believe it. Believe God's promises, we are told. In Councils to Teachers, page 97. If we ever know the truth, it is because we practice it. That truth is not truth to those who don't practice it. It's more than just saying it. You must believe. You must practice it, brothers and sisters. The Bible goes on to say, those who doubt God's pro providing hand, God's provision, those who doubt God's way of provision, they will be cast into outer darkness. Those people are small faith Christians. And small faith Christians are not going to endure the coming blackout. 
spiritually, literally, and the second death. Go to Matthew 8 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Look at verse number 10. It's interesting. Some of you never saw this. Verse 10. When Christ heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found what, my friends, so great faith. No, not in Israel. Look at verse 11. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in God's kingdom, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into what? Outer darkness. What's the contrast? This man had what? Great faith. He was commended. On the other hand, those who were cast out into outer darkness would represent those who have not great faith, but what? No faith. Small faith Christians, brothers and sisters, refuse to exercise faith in God's word. And remember, selected messages, book three, page one, seven, two, we're told faith in the ability of Christ. To save us amply, fully, entirely. Yes, his way in his time is the faith of Jesus. Does that make sense? Go to Job chapter 10. My friends, today, God is going to pay each one of us a visit. Do you know why? Many of us feel like giving up. What did Job lose, my friends? Job felt like giving up. Job lost his children, lost his job, lost his health, lost even his help, meet, support in his house. And Job felt like giving up, my friends. Job says, leave me alone. Let me have a little comfort because right now I'm going into darkness. I'm going into the shadow of death. Job chapter 10. My friends, watch. Have you ever read the shadow of death? What text come to your mind? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's Psalm 23. The Bible calls the shadow of death darkness. Look at Job 10. If you're there, look at verse 20. Are we there, my friends? Job's sentiments. He says, watch carefully. Are not my days few? Cease then and leave me alone. Let me alone that I may take comfort a little before I go somewhere, before I go whence I shall not return. Do you see how he felt? Even unto the land of what? Darkness and the shadow of death. What was Job saying? Nothing makes sense to me right now. I am serving God. I wake up every morning before the sun rises. I spend time in prayer for myself, my wife, my children, my livelihood. And yet I have lost everything. Look at verse 23. He says nothing makes sense anymore. Do you feel that way many times, friends? Verse 23. A land of darkness as darkness itself. And of the shadow of death without any what? Order. No order. I see no order. And where the light to me has become darkness, I see no way out. Look at this now. Light. Listen. Came. Remember, the valley of the shadow of death. Is linked to darkness. Look at Luke now. Oh, I love this. Luke chapter 1. Write this down. Verse 78. Verse 79. I want you to have faith in Christ. Listen. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath what? Visited us. What's today's date? November 6, 2021. Christ has come to pay us a visit to do what? Verse 79, to give what? To give light 
to them that sit in darkness, to them that sit in darkness, in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. Brothers and sisters, is that hopeful? Is that a promise? He will pay us a visit to bring us light. When? When we sit in what? Darkness. We don't see how we're going to make it. There's no order. What once seemed like light has now become what? Darkness. Perplexities. Which way do I turn? What options do I take? How do I survive? How? And my children are looking to me for support. And yet I don't even know my left from my right. If I'm going or if I'm coming. If I'm living or if I'm dying. I don't know. I'm sick with a great diagnosis. Am I going to survive? Will I die? Who will take care of my spouse? Who will care for my children? Who will care for my parents? What was once light has now become darkness. I am bewildered. I'm confused. But praise God, God in his mercy has come to pay us a visit. Is he knocking? Will we let him in? Now, Psalm 23, let's go now. The Lord is my shepherd. Ah, I shall not want, he maketh me. Let's say it, my friends, to lie down. I can't hear you. To lie down. Thank you. In green pastures. He leadeth me beside what? The still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of what? For his name's sake. Yea, though, verse 4, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Do you believe it, my friends? As we are sitting in darkness, do we believe the promises? Notice, my friends, we have to expect darkness in these last days. Watch this. Early writings, page 269 says, I saw some with what faith? Strong faith, I told you. Weak faith. No, no. Earlier I said small faith. I really meant weak faith. Because God can use small faith to become great faith. All right. Now, we need strong faith. I saw some with strong faith and agonizing cries pleading with God. Their countenances were pale and marked with deep anxiety, expressive of their internal struggle. Listen, firmness and great earnestness was expressed in their countenances. Large drops of perspiration fell from their foreheads. Now and then, not all the time, but now and then, their faces would light up. Why light? What was there previously? Darkness. Uh-huh. Now and then, their faces would light up. Cheer up, my friends. Cheer up, my brother. <laughs> Cheer up. Now and then, their faces would light up with the marks of God's approval. And again, the same solemn, earnest, anxious look would settle upon them. Watch the old dragon now. Look at the next paragraph. Evil angels crowded around, pressing what? Pressing what? Darkness upon them. For what purpose? To shut out Jesus from their view. That their eyes might not be drawn, that their eyes might be drawn to what? The darkness that surrounded them and thus they be led to distrust God and murmur against him. That's the purpose of darkness. Do you see it now, friends? Their only safety was what? In keeping their eyes directed where? Upward, that's Luke 21, verse 25 through 27. God's angels had charge over his people. And as the poisonous atmosphere of evil angels 
was pressed around these anxious ones, God's heavenly angels were continually wafting their wings over them. For what purpose? To scatter, brothers and sisters, the thick darkness around them. Psalm 37 says, The angel of the Lord and campeth round about them that fear him, and what? Delivereth them. Would you praise God, my friends? Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14 says, Are there not ministering spirits, angels, sent forth to minister unto them who shall be heirs of righteousness? Praise God for his angels. And Matthew chapter 18 says, We all individually have guardian angels. Again, I ask, for how long was there darkness around Calvary's cross? How long? Bible says, go to Mark 15. The Bible says in Mark 15 and verse number 33, from the third, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour for three hours. And friends, we are told darkness surrounded Christ. And we are told also that Jesus, in that time of darkness, could not see beyond the portals of the tomb. What does that mean? Christ was brought to a point at the closing scene of his earthly ministry. He did not even know he would rise from the tomb. What is God saying to us? When we come to our closing scenes of earth's history, many times there is going to be darkness around us. So much so, we won't even know if we are going to endure, persevere. Will we make it? Will we survive? Jesus, did, come to the screen. Christ did not know. He did not see through the portals of the tomb. So my question was, what sustained Christ? He looked back at past blessings from his father. And that's why we are told in life sketches, page 196, we have nothing. We have nothing, friends. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget how God has what? Let us. In our past history, my friends, nothing to fear for today nor for tomorrow. That's it. Your faith, your hope will tremble in these last days. But claim God's promises. Spend time in prayer. Surrender all to Christ. I close. Go to Psalm 107. By the way, it's right there. Oh, that men should what, my friends? Psalm 107, verse 8 says what? Oh, that men would praise the Lord. Why? For his goodness. Will you praise God today? Amen. And the more we praise God, is the more God blesses us. Enter into his gates with what? Thanksgiving. And into his courts with what? With praise. Oh, that's safe to serve local and safe to serve international and first-time viewers. Oh, that we all would praise God for his goodness and for his wonderful works to his children. Verse 9, why? Why must we praise him? Why? Verse 9, he satisfieth the longing soul. Has he done that for you? He fills the hungry soul with goodness. Has God done that for you? So what are we to do? Praise God. Verse 10, such as sit in darkness, in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction, bound in iron. Is that you? Then they cried unto God in their trouble, and God saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness, praise God, and the shadow of death, praise God, and break their bands in sunder, praise God. Verse 15, everybody. Oh, that men would what? Praise God for his goodness. What has God done for you? Has God done any of this for you, friends? So what are we to do right now? Yes, I know. Day, I was driving here, hearing all of the complications 
with the system back there. I was singing in my mind, in the car, with my family. Days are filled with sorrows and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. But what? Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Why? Because Jesus is near. Hold on. Next stanza. Troubled soul, the Savior can see every heartache and pain. But what, my friends? Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Why? Jesus is very near. Must we praise him? And that's why some of you, as you patiently waited for us to fix stuff back there in prayer. What song were we singing? Days are filled. I even told you, sing my version. Sabbaths are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. But what? Burdens are lifted on the Sabbath. Why? Jesus is very near. Must we praise God, my friends? Praise him. Praise him. Must we praise him? To God be the glory, my friends. Why? Great things hath he done. Beloved, I feel like praising him right now. And the best way to praise him is on our knees as we surrender our hearts to him. Today, do you recommit your soul to Christ, my friends? Do you? Why not raise your hand right now? Do you, friends? Did God speak to your soul today? Was the wait worth it? My soul was filled. And what God is showing us, this what happened today from 9 a.m. to 3.30 3 p.m. is a great object lesson for our lives. We can make plans. We can even pray and fast. But what if God says, I'm going to put a delay on this to see how you're going to respond? How are you going to respond in a time of delay? How will you respond in a time of weariness? How will you respond? Let me tell you something. Times are going to get more difficult. It's going to get more difficult. But the more difficult times become, the more power is available. For where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Let me stop talking before that computer drops the signal. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for your word today. We're thankful for this test. And I pray that we passed it. As in the baptismal class, we are learning our ABCs and how to apply our ABCs. And I pray that we have applied our ABC today. Keep us faithful, dear God. Please, please, may what we heard today resonate and leave a permanent stain upon our minds. For we have nothing to fear for the future except we forget the Ebenezers. The hands were raised in recommitment of souls, their lives to you. The baptismal candidates are preparing themselves for baptism. Seal every decision and seal us for your kingdom. And may we go forward now to call people from darkness into your marvelous light. Provide resources for us that we can be in the right location and have also the resources. A great darkness, gross darkness is just ahead. And we need light in our vessels. We can't be found like the five foolish virgins, but like the five wise virgins, having extra virgin olive oil in a spiritual sense in our lamps, our souls, our homes. We thank you for the fresh bread from heaven's bakery today. We praise you. We thank you. Because, Lord, you are worthy to be praised. Is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.